Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. This show is brought to you by Flatiron's Tuning, your source for any aftermarket or OEM Subaru parts. Be sure to check out our store at flatironstuning.com, and stay tuned with Flatiron's Tuning. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is episode number 86 of the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. I am here today with another special guest. We have got Ken from KNS Brakes joining us today. And uh, we are going to talk about, was it turbos? I think it was turbos. Is that what? No, it's brakes. That's that's right. It's Canis brakes. We're going to talk about brakes. And Ken, I've been talking to you for, for actually quite a long time. There's a lot of a lot of brake stuff that you make for the Subaru specifically, but you make a lot of brake stuff for tons of different cars, and that is your specialty. But the first question I have for you is, how did you get involved with brakes in general? Because it's brakes is it, it's a it's a critical crucial element of a car it's critical to going fast but it is probably the most unloved and easily overlooked aspect of a car's performance so how did you how did you find your your specialty well that's a good question uh so uh i'm an engineer by trade i went to i have a mechanical engineering degree and the first part of my career was spent i went to michigan right away to try to get a job for you know i always like cars so i want to get mm-hmm. a job for one of the automakers and I moved, I went to school in the Washington DC area and got out of school in the early nineties. And I got an engineering job in Michigan, moved to Michigan and uh, found myself in a large door trim panel factory. Okay. About 2 million square feet. Cool. Now, when I said I liked cars, I was telling the truth. Yeah. I didn't know what a door panel was though. Like many people, I bought car and driver, read that religiously and I liked cars and yeah. didn't have a lot of money to buy one or anything. Didn't really wrench too much as I, you know, you know like cars. And so I said, hey, I'll go get a job there. However, door trim panels, and, you know, this was a 2 million square foot factory. It, they used to make Packards there, believe it or not. Okay. And in the back of the place uh, was an old test track, actually, but we used it for storage. Okay. Anyway. Uh, That part of my career was essentially unsuccessful. I did do a stint at the General Motors Desert Proving Grounds uh, a few years later in the mid-90s and actually saw, at least I got a little closer, I saw a lot of the testing on the then-to-be-released C5 Corvette, which came out in 98. And they were doing like endurance testing on a five-mile oval and, of course, Phoenix hot, et cetera. Wow. Whatever. Anyway, I wasn't involved in that. I did fuel emissions testing validation. So, again – not the performance aspect that I was the reason I like cars to begin with. Sure. So kind of shorten that story. But anyway, a few more years of engineering, did some pro E or uh, 3d modeling type work. And uh, it just sort of fizzled out. And I ended up finding a job in New Jersey, believe it or not. It's a long story how I got there, but I ended up there and I got a job working for a guy who was importing brake rotors. Okay. And he was trying to get into the performance world. And I was trying to stay. I had sort of done some sales stuff now at this point after sort of stopping some of the engineering stuff. And uh, anyway, he hired me. And he was importing, like I said, importing brake rotors primarily and some other parts. And so all this performance stuff is back when DSMs. This is the early 2000s. Right. So there was a lot of DSMs, uh, Hondas, of course, you know, that whole sort of import market. He got sort of privy to that. And uh, he hired me to help him launch his performance group. Okay, okay. And uh, we started with 21 part numbers. They were brake rotors. They're like what he had seen in Nopi magazine, for example, if you can remember that. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, you know, he's going to make some drill brake rotors. And so he did. And he said, here's the part number list. Go sell them. And he helped us get this running. And this is 2002, mind you. So one of the part numbers he had... Someone told him, make the front rotor for this thing called a Subaru WRX. Right. And so right. we had 20 numbers, which are DSMs and Hondas, and this one number called a Subaru WRX. Okay. So turns out a vendor who you probably know, AZP Installs in New Jersey, he's been there since the beginning. Mm-hmm. I find him through the internet and, of course, good old Nasioc, which sure. uh, we know what that led to. I mean, that was, yep. that was everyone came from there, obviously. Yep. That was the starting point. That was the catalyst. It was, yeah. And so Paisan of ACP Installs, who was member number four on NASIOC, and oh boy, wow. you know, wow. my, whatever, that kind, of, right. that kind of history there. Right. He they, was a Subaru shop. So I take my one drilled rotor down there, and turns out those guys go to the racetrack. Okay. So I'm like, I'm going with you. 
Okay. And we, from New Jersey, we'd go to Pocono was one. That's a sort of an infield type track. And then they would do a pilgrimage to VIR every February or March with uh, NASA, which is a sports car, you know, amateur yep. racing organization. Yeah. So, you know, they, of course, don't bring us those drill rotors. They're super people. So they can argue with everything we say. Right. And I was like, that's fantastic. I'm going to hang out anyway. Because okay. I'm persistent. Okay. And so anyway, I developed a great relationship with Mike and his some of his customers who track the cars and the guys that work there, et cetera. Started to really learn a lot about you know, kind of the track days or this amateur racing thing. We go to VIR. I mean, we go in February when it's terrible in New Jersey. And there in Virginia, 70 degrees and sunny. Perfect. It's a perfect weekend. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I found the right thing. Yeah. So I, I keep working for the other company for a little while longer. And finally, one day I was like, I don't, I feel like I can do it better, basically. I see a need. I mean, the Subaru, Subaru was, uh, you know, blowing up essentially. Right. The oh, yeah. was a smash hit. I mean, if you can imagine how that was, people can't oh, remember yeah. probably many, but it was, it was nuts. And it was like, oh my God, you'd run, run across the street and be like, I see your WRX, you yeah. know? And so, yep. uh, you know, we descended upon everything at that point. And I saw, you know, a, a car that people weren't necessarily familiar with. And the use of it that wasn't necessarily common or understood. And it wasn't vendors, expected. It was yeah. And everyone was it, it was like that was one of the first, well, it was not the first, but it was one of the first four door sedans that people actually took to the track is is it is a sports car, but it's a sedan. And yeah, it was people. like, what is that thing? Right. I mean, I I've you know, I after a few years. So anyway, I'm going with those guys. I'm like, I can help these guys with brakes better than my employer. And so basically right. At the time, we were selling Hawk brake pads. We had uh, come up with them. And I kind of said, I called up Hawk and got with my sales reps there and says, you know, what if I do this myself? Can I be a distributor for you guys? And mm -hmm. made some deals and, uh, you know, I started selling brakes out of my basement, essentially. So, so that was that was the origin of K&S brakes. Is, is you, 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 you kind of started with Subaru. You, you saw the need. You, you were you were dealing with these, these people and you realized, okay, I can I can do this better in and you went out and you did it. I definitely started with Subaru 100%. I didn't even ever imagine getting out of Subaru. And essentially, it was, you know, I, I, I wrote things down. I mean, I was in my 40s already. I was like, okay, what's the mission statement here? Right. I'm going to provide knowledgeable resource and in-stock parts for Subaru vendors. And I'm going to mm -hmm. supply them brakes. I don't care about the blow valve, front lip, the yeah. scoop, sway bar, or otherwise. I help you with the brakes. So I'm going to learn the brakes. Yeah. I already knew a lot about it from my previous experience and engineering background. And I always could see, as you mentioned right away earlier, the sort of customers and users, eh, they kind of know, they kind of don't, and many don't, and many have questions. And so I was like, this is a, this happens every time. It's the same questions all the time or similar right. questions. So let's develop the knowledge and help both the dealer, i.e. someone like yourself, who is, considering the entire car yeah. and then, uh, you know, help the end user, uh, as well. That that's for, for what you were doing coming in, like there, there are brake companies. Like if, if somebody's watching this or listening to this and, and it's like, all right, think of two companies that make brakes. I mean, you could probably think of like Brembo and AP racing or something along those lines, but those companies, those are, those are companies are big and they have like a long tier of stuff that they make like big brake hits and everything like that. It yeah, sounds like yeah. you, you were also specializing, but you were focusing on like, like the, the most commonly used parts, the rotors and the pads. And maybe I think, I think also like some like small calip, uh, brackets and stuff to get calipers to fit on different applications, but you were kind of, that's what, that was your focus. Is that right? Well, yeah. So, so, you know, in 2005, I mean, the SCI was brand new, fantastic right. car, all, all that kind of, you know, everything, of course. Um, I remember the first one I ever drove, and it was a 2004, and it lasted in New York City for about 24 hours. Yeah, so you sounds right. What happened to those cars? They, you know, they they were gone before you saw. Yeah. you know, gone in 60 yep. seconds or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, we quickly realized we take the WRX to the track and like, all right, then it definitely wants to go. It kind of wants to turn. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really want to stop too well. At least not mm -hmm. a lot. And 
we need to start to pay attention to this. So especially the WRX too. Like the, the STI was way better than the WRX. The WRX oh, was yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean the, the WRX is remember at this point there's not very many STIs. There's right. quite a few WRXs already we have three years of production. They were twenty thousand a year. And these are shiny new toys for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, and up in the Northeast, for example, much like your area and then maybe the Pacific Northwest, you know, the concentration of cars in the enthusiast's hands is pretty high. Oh, yeah. And we would go to track days and, you know, there'd easily be 10, 15, or 20 Subarus. And of course, the old school RS guys are bringing their yep. stuff out and what are yep. these turbo stuff, blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty apparent pretty quickly that stopping the car was going to take some doing. And so we want to figure out, of course, the first thing is it's a Subaru. They're interchangeable. So right, right. it all bolts on, except when it doesn't, which you, I'm sure at this point, but we've said that over and over again. Oh, like, yeah. Well, it should fit, but unfortunately, it just doesn't quite work right. One of the guys here used to say that Subarus were like Legos. Everything, everything just bolts together. And, and it does until it doesn't. Like there's, there's like the, the ones that will catch you out, the ones that don't fit quite right it usually goes really bad really quickly oh you, you start changing everything something. then it's like yeah. at that point it's kind of like i mean that happened right away with the, the with the rear brakes on stis that mm -hmm. was the first thing we sort of got creative with yeah you know, we see the regular subaru one piston rear brakes we see the nice two piston brembo's on the rear We're like how do we make that work on that there were some solutions uh but the difference in the hubs from the R160 rear end of the uh, WRX versus the R180 setup on yep. an STI, all the parts were different. Yep. And you you could you had to find some place of where to where to break it to go from basically a WRX to an STI. And you can still do that in a variety of ways. You can you can do rear diff, rear axles, and rear hubs yeah. from an STI and put, I think, a WRX automatic drive shaft on a five-speed, yep. you break yep. it there, or you can be like, I just want to put the Brembo's on. So we made a caliper adapter. That was yes. what I did. I said, that was the first thing I did is right. I saw this adapter to get the caliper onto the regular WRX. Right. And then we had to make a provision for the parking brake. And for so the parking we brake. Had two, two solutions for that. One yep. is a rotor with a, a, a smaller fender section, essentially. An yeah. insert, correct. Or the other was to make the thicker parking brake shoes. And yep. Which is which is our preferred method because with those with the adapter rotors you have I think it's DBA and Brembo are your two two options and the rotors are really heavy because they just they press in a basically a steel slug to take up the space in in a normal rotor they didn't they didn't machine the rotor to be smaller they just press in this adapter so they right. weigh like I want to say it's like thirty four pounds each. Which is well, it's not of, quite that much, but a, a rear, let's see, a rear STI rotor is probably, I'd say, 18 pounds. Yeah. The adapter rotor is about 23 or 24. So it is yeah. a little bit of weight. It does make for a, a little bit neater, cleaner install, especially for a DIY or at home type. Sure. And it may seal off the parking brake drum area a little better. But we kind of went at it with the, if you're going to buy, we have to buy rotors anyway. Maybe yeah. just get the adapter rotors to avoid you from purchasing the parking brake shoes. But if you already have rotors, you can buy these shoes yeah. and, you know. Yep. And and then having the adapter shoes, now any of the standard S10 rotors become an option. So you just have yeah. more to choose from. Your replacements then are yeah. a, little more, yeah. a little more available. That's correct as well. Yeah. So so it sounds like you're, you had an engineering background. You had a lot of experience in the automotive field. And then kind of brakes found you. Like just that's kind of what what worked well absolutely yeah so i mean i was interested i the whole material science and uh design of rotors which seems like it's just this round thing but there's a lot to it as you may i mean every part yeah. of car is yeah pretty highly engineered rotors are notwithstanding sure there are tons of differences uh metallurgy design yeah, no, yeah there's so much between casting and and the, the one thing that my uh, was racing break was the previous company he was experimenting a little bit, and that's the part I really liked. He was trying to make a better widget, mm -hmm. and I was down with that. And we had testing, so that's all feeding into my engineering background. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we made some inroads here and there. We found some things that did and didn't work, and just getting that applied down to the end user, that challenge, how to make the car work, really. That was yeah. that was always, and yeah, the the good part about it, or the lucky part, or whatever, is it's hard enough that not everyone wanted to do it. Yeah. Uh, Packing and shipping brake rotors, no one wants to do that. No, no. <laughs> and, uh, 
we sort yeah, of took it on, and luckily it's a consumable, so they tend to call back. It, and it, it, it's a consumable and it's a critical part. It's a critical part. If you're going to be tracking your car, you're going to be going through brake pads and you're going to be going through brake rotors. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, this is not a, we're driving Subarus, not Miatas. Yeah, and even yeah. Miatas, you're still, once you're racing the car, you know, the yeah. higher your level of competition or usage, the more important the brakes are. I mean, it's yeah. easy to hit the go pedal. It's not as easy to hit the stop pedal, especially if the car doesn't consistently do what you're asking it to do. For sure. Well, and, and, we, we had talked a little bit kind of leading up to this and I made the comment that, so, so my, I made the comment that I think the easiest thing to develop on the car is, is power engine and power brakes is harder than that. And I think, I think the hardest thing to develop on a car is the suspension. And, and to an extent, the reason for that is one, there's a lot more R and D that's put into the, all the engine stuff. There's so many shops and people that are trying a lot of stuff. It's like, it percolates out fairly quickly. What, kind of the, the best paths, the proven paths are to make power. And everybody hits the loud pedal the same way. But when you get to brakes, how you're driving, how you're using the brakes has a huge impact on how they work, how they're gonna last. Um, and and to, an, to an extent, suspension is like that, like to the next, to the next order, because there's just so much driver involvement there. You know, when you get to the brake pedal and then, then turning the car, there's so many variables that you as the driver are introducing and with the, with the throttle is, I mean, it, maybe the timing and how, how quickly go wide open, but that's about it. It's pretty simple. Well, very true. Yeah, of course. So, you know, if you take, if you think the number of things happening as you're entering a turn, I mean, you're braking you're slow in the car now you, and then you're turning the car. Those are all accelerations just yeah. in a different direction than forward. Yep. And you're doing them simultaneously now. So, and you have, you know, tires, uh, alignment, uh, you know, the weight transfer of the car from the from the rear to the front as you yep. slow and turn, getting the car to rotate, and then you know, all it's, that's happening at once. And it's, it's a ton of variables. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on, and it's under the threat of a very poor outcome if it doesn't go well. Right. That's the part. You know, if the brakes and or suspension don't get you around the turn, you either you go off the track. Right. You know, if the go pedal stops working, you when you coast off, yeah, but pull you're off, pretty but, much yeah. okay. Yeah. If you can't stop and turn though, you end up not where you want to be. And so it's, it's a little more immediate and yeah. certainly, certainly the, you know, the after the effect of a, of a poor outcome is a little, a little, yeah, a little it, it's, it's more immediate. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and so to that end, it, the funny thing is, is that brakes there, there's, there are, for most of us, most of us driving a car on the street, especially brakes are just always there and they always seem to work that yeah. there's a, it's a really well-designed and robust system. And it really only starts to need attention when you really start pushing the car. And I think that because they're there and they work all the time and it, and, you know, a lot of people feel like, okay, if I can just hit the brake pedal and I can lock up the tires or I can get the ABS to engage, the brakes are good. Like as long as I hit the pedal, it stops, brakes are fine. It, it's this blind spot because when you when you aren't thinking about them, when you don't really need them, they're always there. But then you take it to the track and you start really pushing the car, and all of a sudden, like this this old reliable system, all of a sudden you you find the limits of that pretty quickly. But it's it's this blind spot for people, it seems. Well, yeah, and, and I would expound on that. So it's it's a pretty easy test. Uh, you know, go get in whatever street car you have, and your first test is the test of your engine. So yeah. go accelerate. From say, and we don't have to, you know, pick 20 miles an hour to save your tires. Right. Go from 20 to 70 and do it five times in a row. Yeah. Probably can do that right in a row without any hiccup. You probably wouldn't overheat your car. Probably nothing bad would happen. You could just continue to drive on. Right. Then I, and full throttle. Then I would have you do the same thing in reverse, break from 70 to 20 five times in a row. And I'm pretty sure that by the end of the fifth stop, your brakes won't quite be working the same. Especially if everything is stock. Yeah. yeah. When you first started. And in fact, I honestly don't do that unless you know what you're doing, because, right. you know, I wouldn't do that in a regular street car. It's it, the, the brakes can be overwhelmed on a street car relatively easily. Yeah. They, like I said, they will work once well, but to do, to ask them to do, and on a, in, a, on a, in a regular track day event, say 20 minutes long, you're going to hit the brakes three or four times in the first lap. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, or more. This, yeah, or more. Time and time again, you know, I'm just a beginner. 
um, you know, I've got my STI, I stage two, the tune, got some pretty nice tires on it. And I decided not to do the brakes. And, you know, that's a good way to have about 20 minutes of fun and then right. kind of wonder what happened. And right. then you're scrambling around, one, you know, then you then all of a sudden you the light goes on and you're like, oh, now I got to, well, get all that's, this stuff. Right and that's the thing that's always forgotten is you, you step on them once and they're there and you think everything's fine. The brakes are perfect. We're, we're good to go. Let's go to the track. The thing that you forget is the brakes are designed to work once under that really high load, really high, high, uh, high use situation. It's the repetitive use when the brake system starts to fall on its face or, or can start to break down. And that's, that's what, unless you've driven at the track, you kind of just forget the like, hey, there could be a situation where I'm driving where I'm going to have to be hard on the brakes, hard on the yeah. throttle, make a turn, hard on the brakes again. And get on those brakes really, really hard over and over again. And that's where that's where the weakness starts to come up. That's where the brakes start asking for some attention. Well, yeah, it's if you think, you know, some without getting too sort of physics or engineering involved, you really, it's a couple of easy way to think about it. So when you accelerate, you can barely overwhelm the tire above say 25 right. miles an hour. Right. So you, you can't exceed the acceleration level in forward is, you know, less than the tire will take. Right. But when braking, you can, as long as the brakes are working, you can put the tire right on its limit and deaccelerate. Well, so deacceleration and acceleration in terms of power are essentially the same thing. It's just a yeah. plus sign and a negative sign. Yep. So if you can imagine you're putting all that power into your brakes, and in fact, more power into your brakes because yeah. can, you, can, you can put them on the limit relatively easily. Yep. Yet, meaning, but yet at the same time, you know, your engine cools is gigantic, well, not gigantic, but it's large with a big yeah, yeah, radiator, radiator yeah. in the front of the car. Meanwhile, your brakes are, I mean, it all adds up because there's four of them, but the mass and cooling ability is clearly much less efficient. Yep. And yet they're being asked to handle much more power. So it's yep. pretty easy to see why the heat's going to build up rapidly. And there's no real provision in the brakes for telling you they're overheated other than they stop working. Right, right. You get a little bit of feedback, which is like a spongy pedal most of the time. Yeah. And it goes from like, hey, this is a little bit softer than I remember yeah. to where did the brake pedal go? And yeah, at that I'm point, now, now you're a passenger. Yeah, you're along you're for the passenger. ride. That's correct. Yeah. And, well, and, uh, and yeah, so, we, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was gonna say, so, so to that end, like, like the, the starting point, if you're going to try and improve the capacity of the brakes is the pads and the rotors, the, the two things that are working together to stop the car. And in brake pads, there are a lot there. I mean, I've, I've talked to you about a bunch of different brake pads. So I know that at this point, you work with a lot of different brake pad manufacturers. So there's a lot of options out there. Correct. And I would, I would say that there's probably, I, I think I can say this with certainty, there's way more brake pad compound options out there than there are even tire compound options. Because like, like when you get into like really aggressive street tires, or race tires, there's just a handful of compounds. Like hand, uh, Hoosier has two compounds, maybe yeah. three. But like brake pads, like- the other guys have one, right? Right, and Hawk, I mean, they've got, geez, seven or 10 different compounds. I mean, G-Lock has got 12, six. six? Well, got, I think they have, I don't know, you're making me count. A lot, it's six, a lot. Six track and two street. Hawk is relative, about maybe five track and three street. Yeah. Um, and even other makers like, say, uh, Paget or PFC, yep. they maybe don't have street pads the same, but they'll have at least three or four track compounds um, alone because, you know, there's a variety of, of usages. Uh, a Miata on 200 yeah. treadwear tires is a whole different ask than an STI on slicks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's sure. a whole different ask. And, and these pads, these pad compounds are, they behave differently. They, they work oh, yeah, differently. And, and that's where like all of a sudden, if you want to make that first step and get a, a track pad, now you have all these compounds to choose from. And then that's where that like, one, you have to run, you have, if you're going to start tracking a car, you've got to try a, a track pad because if you're, all you're used to is a street pad and you, and you go to the track, there is a whole nother world of performance. There's a whole nother world of, of, of stopping capability that the pad itself can bring to the table, but you never experience it until you try a compound, a different compound that's more built for track use. Absolutely. And I'll just add one thing to that. So I have a prop yeah. here. I had to have one or two. Yeah. So, so you know, we, have, we could think of two cars, uh, maybe a uh, 
a WRX is, you know, 3,500 pounds. And, you know, yeah. that's the rear, that's the rear brake pad. That's what you're dealing yep. with on the rear of the car. Yep. So it's, it's not the best comparison, but a new Camaro ZL1, which it's a little heavier, but they put a little bit more brake pad on the car. It's oh my now gosh. that big. Can, can so, you hold them yeah. side by side? Yeah. That's, so this is, you know, what you're comparing. And that's, so that's the rear. That's the no, rear. No, this is the rear, yeah. I mean, I'm, it's, you know, it's dramatic, but. That's huge. Yeah, so, so what you were talking about as far as like using stock parts on the car to go to a track day. Yeah. Well, certainly brake fluid in your car is not going to happen. Right. You need to put a higher temperature brake fluid in the car. As far as pads go, this is another thing people don't realize. The Camaro guy that gets a ZL1, now this is a race pad, it's a Hawk race pad, but mm -hmm. his car came with a Brembo system designed to deal with ZL1-ness. And right. especially in their 1LE package, you know, it's somewhat capable enough to get you to do a track day yeah. to a newer user. But at some point, you're going to outrun it because it's still a street compound. Your, your, your O2 WRX came with a street pad and yeah. a little one to begin with. It and it's a reasonably a heavy car. car. Yeah, and it's a pretty heavy car. And, you know, while it was, you know, 215, it's enough to get that thing around the track. Yeah. And this is not going to do it. Right. So you have to make that, that decision, you know, that thought train of what do I do to go to the track? You definitely figure out where you're starting from first, because that'll give you a better indication of how you might want to prepare. Would you say, like, what would you say would be the prime consideration? Like, I, I want to say that most of the time when I talk to people that want a better brake pad, a lot of what they go to is just pedal feel. They want, they want to feel like the car is stopping with a minimal amount of pressure to the pedal. I, I, think that, I think that's a fair description of what they're looking for. They want it to feel like the car is really eager to stop as soon as they apply any pressure to the brake pedal. Would you agree that that is a valid criteria for picking a brake pad, or would you say there's, there's something else to consider? Well, it's certainly a good start. Uh, the one thing, we want to balance the heat requirements so that's necessarily not what's it's likely related to the friction capability of the pad, but the heat it's going to get under track use. We that's, have to figure out what that is because that's the range of heat that we want the pad to operate in. And that's what's missed. I think most often is thinking about, okay, what kind of heat circumstances, what, what kind of heat load am I putting through the braking system right. just in general and, and considering it from a heat load standpoint versus just a driver input standpoint. Correct. Now we do want to, the other thing is too, is if you can imagine the goal of the brakes is to put the tire on the limit of traction and control and be able to control that. So if your pedal feel or pedal pressure is either too heavy, i.e. you have a low friction pad or too light, you have a very high friction pad, but not enough tire grip, then it's going to be difficult for you to modulate the tire on the limit of ABS. When you're, cause when you're in ABS, the tire is alternately skidding and rolling, and that is not the fastest way to slow down because while the tire is skidding, your stopping distance increases. So it's, right. it's, it's good, but it's not ideal. Ultimately, you get the tire right on the limit of ABS and, and hold it there. And then, of course, as the car is slowing, you may have to modulate that pedal to get it there. And also, too, you know, Subarus don't exactly have the – greatest pedal feel all the time. Right. So maintaining that or creating that ability when you're driving the car is really what you're after. And then you'd be able to withstand that over and over again. So, and I wanna, I wanna just highlight a little bit what you meant there by modulation. So modulation, what you're, I think if I can, under, let me try and paraphrase here, is, is that you're applying a pressure with the pedal but you have the ability to apply a little bit more or a little bit less pressure and control. Like, is the car going to stop a little bit faster or can I lift off on the pedal a little bit and just have like the car carry a little bit more speed. So you have a right. lot of a high degree of control of how the car is stopping with the pedal, with the pressure on the brake pedal. Well, one yeah. thing, think if this is yeah. exactly right. And more specifically, you can think about it driving a Subaru. The cars are often considered hard to turn. Right. They want to push because they're, essentially drive similarly to a front drive car. It's always right. the thing with front or all wheel drive cars is getting the turn. So you use the brake pedal to turn the car. 
Yeah. So now you're, you're breaking the straight line as you get near a turn, but then as you start to want to turn in, you're going to be coming out of the brake some so that you can add steering. So that balance and then having that in the suspension, of course, is equally uh, uh, yeah. in the game here, but yeah. getting the car to rotate is easily or a lot often, you know, what the brakes, the ability to break the car, control the braking is a big part of that. Yeah. Trail, trail breaking the car to use the weight transfer to get the rear end to lighten up and kind of start to come around and then hold it there and Correct. catch it on the throttle. And then just, you know, then and at that point, then that's when all the fun starts on all-wheel drive right. because right. once you get a point at the apex, well, at that point, then you can't wait to get out of the brakes because then you just take your, then you get to go to the right. loud pedal. Right. And that's right. the really fun part is digging out of the turn. Right. Because everything right. you gave up on the way in is usually what you can get back on the way out. And that's, yeah. you know, it's... It's quite far, obviously. So, so that's where you, that's where brakes, you can actually have control of the stopping and to an extent, like for a more experienced driver, you can actually have control of the turning with the brake pedal, Absolutely. But, you, but you have to have that, that modulation, that ability to control the pressure of the brake pedal to get that level of control with the car. And so like back to the point about like where people are thinking they just want the, the car to slow down with just a little bit of pressure. If you have if you have the wrong compound or too aggressive of a compound, you lose that modulation, or you yeah. can lose the modulation. Yeah. We we certainly want to stop the car. That's the first goal in all of this, of course, because the turn's coming. But absolutely, uh, the, the 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 second half of the whole braking event is the turn in and getting the car the rest of the way slowed down, as well as getting it pointed in the direction where the track's going. And and would you say that once you once you have a pad or say say a group of pads say two or three options of pads that ha all have the functional temperature range of what you through testing or whatever know that you need for your car with with then like the final decision for your your preferred pad compounds in part come down to what that behavior of the pad is like down to that modulation to the level of control that you have through the brake pedal absolutely yeah because we can you know, we can make, just pick an example for, you know, I mean, this is the same customer that we will get repeatedly, um, you know, a, a fairly typical STI, you know, just probably done some mild suspension work, certainly alignment, maybe say dampers and sway bars, pretty common, a couple of bushings, whatever, cars a little lower, so it's not quite so high in the air. So, and then the tires are most often always, you know, they came, they sure they come with the good tires most mm -hmm. of the time. And if not, they can buy them pretty readily. So, that car, you know, that'll, that'll take a lot of brakes if driven hard. It's pretty heavy, you know, a street car in general. And on a street tire, like I said, we wouldn't want to, we probably wouldn't go all the way to the top or highest friction pad. That's a little much for the tire and maybe for the driver as well, because this driver may be a intermediate novice or intermediate. He's been going to a few events. He's moving up. He's getting faster. He's, you know, spending a little money on equipment. So we will put you know, fairly high heat and medium to high friction in the front of that car, say, and maybe a little less friction in the rear. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, then the driver, you sort of, it, it sort of quickly becomes then the driver to tune his setup and kind of decide, okay, I think I, my front brakes are not enough because I'm having to push too hard and I'm right. struggling to control them or my rear brakes, the car's turning too much or not enough. So we start to tweak things a little bit. And certainly we'd love to see people experiment because people can get easily get, they buy one thing, it works okay, but then they hesitate to try something new. Well, and and it's a, I think it's an important point to make in terms of pad compound that, that there is no one best pad compound. There's even in, even in like, a, like a Hawk, G-Lock, Ferrodo, Paget, there's no one compound that is the best for Subarus, period. It, uh, no, not at all. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's there's enough variance there that like like you. What I what I'm trying to get is a lot of people will go to the track and they'll see a guy that's fast and they'll say, well, what are you running? Well, I'm running DTC 60s all around. Okay, and and it works for him. And then they'll go out and they'll buy DTC 60s and it's terrible. And it's because like there there really is a lot of some some set up in some minutia with these with the pad compounds and how you were using them to to land on the pad compound that's going to work best for you so you can't just assume that whatever's working good for this guy or that guy is you put it in your car and it's going to work perfect they might have different brakes they might have different tires they have could have a completely different setup you you have to maybe use that as a starting point but you have to always be kind of looking at the, the behavior that you're getting 
how the brakes are working and always be kind of developing from there. You can't just assume that whatever works for this guy is going to be the perfect to put on your car. Absolutely. And that's hard to do because, I mean, many of the users are, you know, I may only go to the track three or four times a year. That's not the easiest thing to develop a, a testing regime in the limited time. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard yeah. for me to test brake pads and come up with real advice or data. And we're at the track, you know, probably 20 or 30 weeks a year, you know, right. 20 or 30 weekends a year. And just then just to get, this, you know, the same setup, but run a different pad and see the result. I mean, we got to have everything else to say, the tires, the driver, the event, the length of the sessions, the yeah. weather, excuse me. I mean, there's a endless, endless. And then, you know, then the car breaks yeah. from some other malady. So the test is over for the moment. Sure. Sure. And, and like things can change that all of it, like all of a sudden, like a manufacturer changes their tire compound. And now you have to maybe go back a little bit to the drawing board and, and test out pads again, because now if the, if the tires have a different amount of traction, either more or less, now you might need a different compound of pad to work better with now the, the traction that you have through the tire. I'm, I'm sure you could have a whole new uh, podcast 88 about what has happened to 200 treadwear tires. Yes. But, and, uh, yeah. Where, where did the 200 treadwear tires go and what have we yeah. got now? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. They still call them that, but that is, they're not the same. We know that. Or something has happened. I mean, yes. the rubber itself, maybe, who knows, but, uh, you know, the yeah. grip that you can get with these things now is... Uh, they're, they're within a yeah. second of a slick, uh, a second to a second and a half, depending on the track, something yeah. like that. It's it's crazy. And there was a time when 200 Treadwear tires were like, I don't know, three, four seconds off of a slick yeah. tire. They're way faster than they once were. And that means, like... Hey, I've, I've been out of the game. Like there's, there's been stuff in the world that's gone on. I haven't been to the track in like three or four years. I'm getting back into it. I'm going to get a, a set of brand new 200 treadwear tires. And this is the pad compound that I've always used. So this is going to be great. And it's totally different. All of a sudden you're overheating your, your braking system because those same tires, even though it's 200 treadwear, have yeah. way more grip than what you're used to. Now that brake system that was working well before, it's now overtaxed. It's overheated. And you got to kind of, reevaluate make some make some changes yeah well i i do want to kind of touch on some compounds but i, I want to talk about rotors first like we've talked a lot about how brake pads like the, there's the coefficient of friction there's there's the temperature range that a pad is designed to operate in right but you mentioned rotors and the design of rotors what like when you're when you're talking about how the brakes work how the brakes feel the pad the brake pad itself it's it's a pretty one-to-one -one relationship it's, it's like it would operate like what you would expense expect once you know what it's doing with rotors can you feel any difference in the brake pedal from a rotor it, or like what would your criteria be for a rotor if you're trying to select okay so uh well the first thing is we can talk about some of the what you see which is you know drill versus slotted, slotted. versus blanks yep. so forget forget drill rotors they're that's yeah. an aesthetic uh Machining operation that only causes problems. Okay, but now Ken, I'm going to ask you the question that I get all the time. But like Porsches and Ferraris and stuff, they come with drilled rotors. Why? Why don't I want drilled rotors? It comes with all on all these high end cars. Well, they put them on there to help sell the car. On your case, uh, on the track at elevated temperatures, it makes cracking happen much faster. Yeah. And if you have an aftermarket drilled rotor, which means it started as a plane rotor and someone decided to pop holes in it. That's even less good because yeah. at least if you were to look closely at the design of a Porsche drill rotor, they are making concessions for what they are doing to it. Mm. So it is, and also Porsches and or Ferraris, their brakes are also much uh, more designed for track use. So the general size of the parts fits track use of that vehicle more it's, closely. It's way bigger. The heat load on the rotor is going to be much lower versus right. your car that had a, a like your WRX that has a like a it's basically the size of a 50 cent piece up, up front and that's what you're using to stop it, and then you drill holes on it and then all of a sudden that is that is going to get into the, the heat range where that rotor's compromised outside the yeah. first so time you're on the track. Right. Yeah. So the Porsche rotor is vented better and made better to begin with as opposed to drilled by the aftermarket. So the but but even Porsche will tell you, yeah, you know, no, there's that's you know, yeah, they crack at the holes. And and yeah, it, it just it happens. I there was one one time I was at a track day years ago where somebody put on a brand new set of drilled rotors, and by the end of the, the first track day on a brand new set of rotors, they came off the car in two pieces. They had completely cracked across yeah. oh, uh, yeah. basically the, the median. 
know, we, you know, we, we sort of hope at this point, and that, that was actually, well, I hate to kind of, you know, when the 18 uh, STI came out and I saw mm. Joe Broders, I was, I felt like that was, I don't understand that mistake there, frankly. I, I mean, I saw it as an opportunity, I'm not going to lie, but, uh, you know, I, it had to like be I don't for, understand that mistake. It had to be for weight because they, it was, it was a one piece rotor. They made it huge, a 340 millimeter one piece yeah, rotor. Yeah. And it, they weigh, I, even now, I think the stock rotors weigh like 36 pounds, maybe a little they're bit more. I mean, I mean, they're they're real not a lot of, there's not a lot of 30 pound rotors, but I think they're 20, 25, 26. Yeah. But I think it was marketing, frankly. I think they yeah. took a look at Porsche or other higher end cars and said, well, they're, yep. we're going to do it as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But either so, way, Subaru sells it at such a price that, uh, yeah, you know, I don't, yeah. you know, people aren't just, I mean, you, you know, the uh, OEM prices. Yes. They're yes. Kind of, ludicrous quite frankly i mean well i had i had to ask that question because that i keep getting asked that about the drilled rotors because people people see them they want them but it is yeah. it is really not what you want in a in a in your rotors if you're on a street car especially where on like a newer sti and you buy the oem drill rotors there's nothing going to go wrong but there's no reason that they're needed for certain you certainly right. don't need them and, and if and you track the car they're unrecommended not recommended yeah. at all they, they will not sell, last long i don't sell drill rotors unless you make them so now so, we'll move past that anyway, because yeah. that's, you know, this is 2022. Let's hope you yeah. got past that. Yes. Uh, slotted rotors will benefit the brake pad to some extent. It's not night and day difference. It may add a slight bit of torque. It may help keep the pad a little fresher. There's a lot of debris created as you're braking hard all the time. So generally speaking, there's no major problem with it. It, it helps some likely in some cases. It's not hurting. So we're not afraid of that. So we will use slotted or blank rotors. Yeah. Whatever is the case. There's there's a one point, and I think it I think probably even since we you or I started modifying cars, that this point has passed. But there was a point where some pad material, once it got really hot, would start to outgas. And so like that was one of the initial right. reasons for slotted rotors. Like, well, if yes. if all of a sudden this pad material is going to get really hot and there's going to be gas that starts coming out of it, you don't want that gas bubble trapped between the pad and the rotor. The but, I, and the rotor right. but I think at this point, the compounds don't do that anymore. Is that right? Well, they do it when they're new, when you first okay. break them in. So, cause I've, you know, I mean, if you, I put pads on a car, I went right out on the track and yeah, you get about halfway through a session and it's not thrilled. It smells great and uh, all right. that. And so it's, it's probably happening then, but once the pads are, are ran or bedded in, pretty minimal at most maybe if they're okay. if you grossly overheat them they're probably still out best in some but you're using it maybe beyond its capability anyway so okay not failure but 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 problems were imminent uh, if anything like i said the slotting can help with kind of getting rid of some of the dust and debris that's there and yep. keeping the pad surface a little fresher it kind of it kind of scrapes scrapes the pad surface yeah, a little yeah, bit. yeah yeah and you can you can see it doesn't, it see. doesn't wear that fast, but you can actually see the brake dust kind of build up in the slots sometimes. Like Correct. if you yes. come back from a tractor, you can actually see the build up there. Well, good race pad brake dust is pretty much going to build up everywhere, by the yeah. way. Not just yeah. on the rotor slot, but all over everything. It's a mess. I mean, it's, yeah. there's no way around that. Um, so back to sort of like rotors and the difference. So the friction developed by a brake pad on a rotor of cast iron is relatively a small range of performance there. There are alloys, so, so cast iron or rotors or cast iron, gray iron, that's just a type of iron. There's a spec to it, and there are a, a number of alloys in there um, between a very inexpensive parts store rotor and say a more expensive, you know, higher end, whatever uh, brand name. There are differences in the alloy, and that some of those alloys in there do impact the friction characteristics, but it's on a relatively lower level of of uh outcome so that a giant range of the cheapest rotor to the most expensive rotor from the actual friction output right or how the okay. how the brakes actually function so when the first stop the cheap rotor and the expensive rotor are going to work relatively same with rotors it's all about what happens next mm. as it gets hot so okay uh, a rotor is a casting for example so there's a grain structure so if it's made poorly and that grain structure has deficiencies a lot of, lot rotor, of holes in it it could holes or voids parts of the material where it didn't uh make the grain structure correct i mean there's a sort of a precipitation that occurs it's the way it basically it's doesn't manage the heat uh there, there's a number it's pretty minor it's hard to even show in drawings but <clears throat> um 
you know, the rotor will distort and or cone and or harden more unevenly than maybe the better rotor just because it was what made as well. Okay. Uh, there might be one or two, like a basic example. Let me see. It will be hard to see, but so this is the aforementioned ZL1 oh. brake rotor. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so the only thing I'll show you just for it might be hard to tell, but we can see here's our veins inside. So the design of these, these, you know, all it all happens here. The air gap, the plate thickness, and the design of these veins, mm -hmm. that's taking the heat from the friction surface to the center and it blows out. So yeah. all the design of the rotor is there to do that. And certainly there's some engineering behind that. Yeah. Like that, the vein structure in the rotor, because the rotor is spinning, that's that almost the best way to think of that is almost like a fan or an air pump. It is, exactly it is, like pull, it is pulling the air from the center of the rotor through the rotor and then outside. Correct. And so, so when the, it, air like, is, the air is dragged along those veins, collecting yep. heat as it goes, yep. taking it to the out. So the better it is at that, the sooner your, you know, the better your brakes. Well, the, 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 the longer the time before they stop working because once more heat load, it's all over. Yep. And so like when you, when you get into higher end brake kits, a lot of times you can have a selection. Well, like Brembo has, I think, three different rotor types, type one, type three, and type five. They're all the same size. They'll all fit the same brake kit. And a lot of the difference is the vein structure and, and the actual thickness of the, the rotor material. Well, they're, they're, that's, that's actually what this is sliding pattern for them. Okay. But, uh, but uh, they will have multiple rotor sizes for the kits for the front and or the rear of a car. Yeah. Uh, they probably have, I want to say, at least three front Subaru kits. Mm -hmm. One of them is essentially the STI brakes. Yep. And this is a good thing to even touch on as well. You know, those gold Brembo's are pretty nice, and they will take a pretty good amount of track abuse with a good, uh, good pad and, and suitable brake fluid. But that is nowhere near the same thing as a six-piston racing caliper right. with a floating two-piece rotor setup. That may only be, you know, that uh, STI rotor is 326 by 30 millimeters. You yep. might take a rotor an inch bigger, uh, 355 by 32, two-piece rotor, its ability to store or collect, store, and reject heat far exceeds that of the STI Brembo's. Right. So I, I want to just kind of like finish off rotors, but that's the next thing I want to ask you about is definitely the difference between a panda rotor versus going to a bigger brake kit. But like, so the rotors, like a lot of what you're considering to, to kind of, I think to summarize what you've said is a lot of it is the, the longevity of the rotor and it's the rotor's ability to manage heat load. So that the higher the quality of the rotor, the more it's going to be able to get hot, not warp, not wear too quickly, um, and and work well for and you. So either, also, yeah. So like, because there's there's some people that say what you do is you just buy the literally the cheapest rotors you can find for your car. Like if you can go out and you can find a a, a rotor that's fifteen dollars, buy two of them, put them on, run them at the track. When you get off the track, you take them, you throw them away, and you get another set. But like. And I mean, is there is there any logic to that, or is that just kind of playing with fire a little bit? Well, there's definitely logic to it. It's thirty bucks, and right, thirty bucks right. is less than forty bucks. So sure, you know, sure, we're driven by cost all the time. Uh, you know, we we get that all the time. So I will say that, like the thing that people try to do, though, say, well, if it's the rotor sixty dollars and it doesn't last two times as long, I'd rather buy the thirty dollar rotor. Mm. Well, I would say maybe. But, well, it's two things. Like anything, the better, you know, if something's better, the cost increase always outweighs the, you know, percentage increase of improvement or whatever. I mean, I will say that I don't like changing brakes that much. I mean, I'll I do it, it yeah. but I want to, you know, I'd rather not change brakes. So, and I'll pay $30 to not do a two-hour brake job. Right. So, additionally, I don't want to change brakes to the track even less. Right. So, so if we have some cases, uh, you know, a, a WRX would be a good example, by the way, the front rotors on that car, they're going to really struggle. If you were to get like a, just say, we'll just pick even a, a, an 06 WRX, at least it has the four pots, so yeah. a good front caliper, but it really limited for track use because of the size of the system, nice. it's just not uh -huh. enough to deal with the load that's being asked. So putting, putting an inexpensive rotor there, 
I, I feel like it's, it's inconsistent and unreliable and you're definitely going to change it. So I would, I would say that spending a small margin more to have a little more uh, uh, consistent, because it's still going to fail. You're still overwhelming that road. Right. But if you can consist, if you know when it's good and when it's not and when it's time to change it, I feel like that's kind of money well spent for the most well, part. And, and just in terms of heat load, like the better rotor, the thicker rotor is going to have a better ability to absorb that heat load. If the rotor is going to overheat or not be able to dissipate the heat well, that heat is that it is now overloaded with, it's going to transfer back into the pad. You're just, you're going to overwhelm the system sooner. Most you're going to problems more have more issues. Than you have to, yeah. yeah. I mean, ultimately, if the four pot brakes are, they have a place, but. Subaru four pots, yeah. Yeah, they, they do, but for hard track use on a fast Subaru, they're probably overwhelmed. Right. Uh, that, in that particular instance, it's almost like, eh, you can't get enough good. They couldn't make a rotor good enough to live there. We right. Do it the, with the rally guys, but we don't have a choice because they want to run the small wheels. And, and and rally it we we have them on our rally car we i think we're on our third set at this point um they work well and it's the the heat that goes into them is different because on a loose surface where yeah. like rally you get rid of abs like that's one of the first things you do you if you're gonna overwhelm the brakes they lock up and then a lot of times you're actually locking them up to get the car to slide Right. You're not on the brakes as much. You're not you're not trying to shed speed as much. You're actually using the brakes more to set up the corner right. to actually stop the car. So the heat load, the heat demands of the brake system on a rally car are way different. Way different yeah. And and you actually need as much sidewall as you can get in those tires because of how rough the surface is, how many impacts you're going to get. Right. You yeah. you need the tire to be a crucial part of that suspension. So you, you have to shrink the brakes because they're they're just a less they're, they don't need to be as big and have as much capacity in that use. But then, like, you, you take that, those set of brakes to the, to the track, and I can say from experience, you will find out real quick that it's easy to get them real hot. Yeah. And they don't, they don't like that. They do not, no. Which is, so, it's, so that's maybe a perfect segue to how do you know if you need a better brake pad, maybe a better brake pad and a better rotor, or a bigger brake kit altogether? How do you know if you need to actually up the size of the whole brake system. So we, we, we get to ask that all the time. It's like, okay, hey, we're going to the track. So first off, you know, what car do you have and what brakes are on the car? There's a huge difference between the brakes on an O2 WRX and a 22 STI. Yeah. You know, the rotor is two and a half times the mass. The caliper is much larger and the brake pad, et cetera, and so bigger. forth, all that stuff, the size. Yes. So, Let's just say you're somewhere in the middle of all that. It doesn't matter where. Mm -hmm. The first day out, if you're just getting started, you don't need to probably buy a brake kit for your car. It's, right. It may be coming if you end up getting more serious, but the first thing to do is change the brake fluid, make sure the system is maintained properly, and buy a some probably some set of brake pads, uh, an entry-level track pad. And there's yeah. plenty of options out there for something other than an auto zone or sorry yeah. a store brand right don't, free pad. yeah don't go to your your parts store to just pick them up find find a pad from hawk for it or whatever um and, and on the brake fluid we're talking about dot four brake fluid so so a brake fluid that has a higher boiling point correct so as you're as you're applying the brakes on track hard over and over again and putting heat into the system that fluid can get hotter before it actually gets to the point where it boils and is compromised because right. when the fluid boils that's when the pad gets spongy and the, the the pro tip here is as soon as that brake pad gets starts to get sponges you can as soon as you can feel that it's starting to get soft slow down cool everything off maybe even come yeah. into the pits it does not get any better from that point it only it gets really worse doesn't. yeah yeah so you're you're kind of like if it's fun you can maybe cool down and kind of preserve the system for the remainder of the day or session right. or event but yeah. you're you've sort of found the limit right and we, we don't mind knowing and having users know what it's like to have the brakes become overwhelmed because it's likely to occur at some point in your It's experience. good to know, 100%. You know, I mean, you just want to know what that feels like. It's like, okay, the last turn, uh, a little rough. To, so when the pads sort of get overwhelmed, they sort of kind of feel a little rough. And obviously, when the pedal gets long, you know, you're like, okay, this is, I can't just keep doing this because yeah. it's not going to work. Um, but generally, we'll say, you know, if you're, if you're tracking your car, you, you, you got a track pad in the car, you got a high temperature brake fluid. If you can't get through, you know, a weekend or so, a full weekend, and with 
almost no drama as far as your brakes. If you can't do that, then you need to probably visit, you know, take, take a look at what's on the car right. and think about improving options. Yeah. So, so in terms of pad, can you, can you just mention a, a couple of compounds like what we're talking about? If the car is stock, you're, you're going to the track for the first time, you want to see what it's all about. What are, what are a couple of compounds that would be a good fit that they would be like that entry-level track pad? Well, so if we take entry-level track pad, we think of sort of entry-level tires, entry-level yep. car, maybe yep. a nice car or a newer, like a new SCI or something, but yeah. still entry-level everything else. So we don't want super high friction, really. We need heat resistance because we're going to probably drive until they tell us to stop because we've right. just started doing this and it's more fun than anything. Yeah. And, you know, we may not quite... Uh, and we may not quite know when to say when. You know, you're, you're, you're just getting right. started. You're like, I want to, until they tell me I have to go, I'm driving to the bitter end. Yeah. So, you know, I know you sell G-Lock pads. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some great compounds. G-Lock R8, R10, and maybe even R12 in the front if it's on, a say, an STI with some tire and maybe a, some more uh, experiences coming along. Yeah, a car you know, that's a little bit faster. Yeah, but also the cars a faster, et cetera. And I mean, I, I assume the newer cars are heavier, of course, as well. Um, if you had to say an older, maybe a, a, a GR, like a GR hatch with a WRX, that's small brakes, they're going to get hot pretty quick. Yeah. You know, a set of a set of R sixes or R eights, and that may not may not quite get you where you need to be, unless I mean, you got to gauge yourself too. I mean, I, I think you might know when you're going to your track day of where you think you're going to be driving the car. As soon as you get started, you know, I've written and I've written with students. Uh, they're like, you're going to be better than me once you get practice. And mm. it's relatively obvious. They're not a, mm. you know, they can pick out breaking points pretty quickly and they can, you know, get the car, right. get, get the tire on the limit of ABS right away. I mean, most times students can't do that. And I have to continue right. to tell them, don't break, don't break, now break and right. break hard. But when you do it, break hard. Right. And no one does that. It's, it's almost, that's almost it's not natural. Training. It's, yeah. it's just not. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so, you know, depending on some of how you, how you come in like that, it, you know, that's a compound that makes sense. R10s, there's a Hawk, they have DTC 60s. Those are a little aggressive for a yeah. beginner. The thirties are okay. Sometimes those can overheat. Overheat. But if you're, if you're novice, like a 30 would be a decent place to start. I've, I've, when I was just starting, I was running the HP pluses. Not with, afraid of those at all. With Great decent start. results. As long as yeah. it's, as long as you're not really pushing hard, you're not going fast. You're not, you don't have a car that's making a lot of power so that yeah. you're not going to like be going 130 miles an hour before you have to break for the second gear corner. Even something entry level like that is okay. But you, you have to always be paying attention to that pedal and, yeah. and, and to we the car. You should do that anyway as you're started. I mean, everything's yeah. new. You're new. The car's new. Yep. You're around new people. You know, you're not done this a lot. So your experience of what's, what's going on. I mean, so, you know. so entry level car when you go out you have a good track day what what do you want to see I, I have a guess but what do you want to see when you go back home and you take your brake your track brake pads out and you're taking them off and you look at them what do you what do you want to see or what are you looking for well the first thing i always you know i can and i'm i do it in the paddock all the time of course but you look at the surface of the disc i mean you could see it's pretty clear that like, well, things are going wrong here. The pad is falling apart and smearing on the road or there's black smears all the way around it, or it's grooving or excessively cracking. I mean, it's going to heat check. That's normal as it gets hot, but excessive cracking, um, uh, et cetera. You can see that right away. Then we take the pad out. I mean, you want to see if it's wearing evenly. In other words, still flat mm -hmm. on a floating caliper, like a non Brembo, any non Brembo Subaru, you're generally expect to see some pad taper, meaning mm -hmm. uneven wear. Um, but if it's excessive, I mean, when we'd run two piston calipers, sometimes the leading edge of the pad may be almost worn to the backing plate and mm. the trailing edge may be 50 or more percent left. So obviously if you're having that excessive wear, you're using the brakes very hard, it's okay. But we would get to the point where we would flip the pads around during lunch, sure. for example, to sure. equalize the wear. And also the flat pad against the flat rotor optimum braking tapered pad that's that long pedal thing coming on so it's not working yeah. as good and now yeah. you know if you're like i said if you do your event and you take it out and there's a lot of crumbling or chunking and then yeah. the other thing is if it's super shiny you can see a blue tint on the pad that's an iron oxide or oxides of metals those are shiny 
you got and hot. Colorful, and they got hot, and you may want to like scuff that up and clean it up and reinstall, flip the pads around uh, to get sort of a mm -hmm. new material against new material again to refresh the surface. The, the other one that I would say is is brake pads generally are painted, usually black or something, some kind of color. You want to yep. see the paint still. If the paint is burned off, and especially if, if you look at the pad material and you see like almost almost ash in the brake pad, you got that thing way hot. That's, yes. that's I had DTC 30s in my Subaru four pots when I went out to the track once. And that's when I took them off, like there was no paint left, that the pad material was was like almost looked like ash material yeah it, and that was that was kind of that was that was where i realized that was the end of of me tracking with those brakes because yes. <laughs> i just completely nuked everything it was it was that was the indicator to make a change yeah so brake pads you know that you know you can read specs by the way everyone they'll they'll kind of publish them um and some will say oh, our pads are good up to you know 1500 degrees or more and however I don't want my brakes at 1500 degrees. No, nowhere near that. No. Right around a thousand is what, you know, kind of a operating range where things are working well. So just because they can, I mean, the rotor, uh, the rotor iron is changing phase and other bad things are happening at 1500 degrees. That's oh, yeah. not a sustainable number. So while the pad may take it, it's not exactly where you want to be. So yeah. you would expect it not to do that very long. When, when you say that like 1500 degrees roughly well like you know you see that the pictures where like your rotor is glowing red like somebody's coming in to a braking zone and the rotor mm -hmm. is glowing red do you roughly know what what temperature those rotors are getting up to at that point once it starts i wish to i did but it's not it's it's less than 1500 i'm pretty sure okay. i mean i could probably google that but i want to for, for some reason i'm thinking like 1100 degrees i was thinking 12 yeah. So, yeah like because there's every now and then, like in broad daylight, if 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 a photographer or somebody takes a picture of your rotor and it's glowing orange, in broad daylight, it's getting hot. Oh like yeah, that might, definitely. Yeah, that might be a sign hot, that yeah. like, okay, you want to make sure that you've got everything like height, like good heat management for the whole braking system. Yep. But if you're you're doing that consistently, and if you're getting any of these other signs of the the system being overwhelmed by by heat, like the, the issues with the rotors, issues with the pads. Maybe that would be another indicator that, like, okay, it's maybe time to look for a bigger brake kit that has a better thermal capacity. Yep. So or, that you can or then, a minimum, you're going to have a maintenance interval that you can understand and plan for. Right. Right. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna make if you drive your Subaru fast, you're gonna turn the rotors red. That's yeah. gonna happen. Yeah. That car will do that, no problem. And, and if you have right. a, a set of rotors or calipers that have dust boots, you're probably going to be replacing those dust boots. If you uh, will. They're, gonna, they're gonna melt and crumble, yes, and that maintenance. I mean, I don't know that we necessarily say you have to change them all the time, although you can think about a Subaru. This is again kind of a thing, oh that's now I get it. You drive to do track days in the summer, the rotors are hot, pads are hot, you melt the dust boots. Mm -hmm. Then in the winter you don't do anything, you swap your pads, but you don't you don't rebuild the calipers. Now you go, now you have no dust boots and you go drive in the mountains in the snow, yeah. sleet, and flush. Yep. And you shove a bunch of salt stuff in there. Yeah. And then, and then next thing you know, the calipers are pistons, pistons are stuck. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So the piston seizes. Yep. So yep. the Subaru, it's just funny. It sort of brings up or sort of these things percolate because, you know, we might melt the dust boots on my Corvette front calipers, mm -hmm. but I don't go drive it in the snow and sleet in the winter afterwards right. to cause additional problems. It cars right. park. Right. So, you know. Well, so, so let's say, I mean, I think. I don't know if there's any other criteria that you'd want to throw out there, but I think that that gives a good sense for when you'd want to look at a big brake up or a brake upgrade. Let's say you're there, you, you want to upgrade the brakes. What yep. are some of the criteria that you have to try and pick? Like, how do you go bigger? How much bigger do you go? And then do you do front and, and rear or just front? Well, so but, Subaru's, you know, it's unique in some ways or in many ways, whatever. So it's mostly talk about the front though. Well, the thing is, if you're not increasing the size of the rotor and or the caliper and pads as well, then it's it, it's somewhat pointless. I mean, right. a four pot caliper that Subaru makes will improve the pedal feel on a WRX, but that's about it. Right. It's not significantly increasing the heat mass of the system. So therefore, yeah, the pedal's gonna feel great, but it's still gonna, it's you're still gonna, you know, it's gonna get real hot. In, 
you're still going to get it really hot in two sessions on track or yeah. 10 minutes on track, whatever. Yeah. There's no way to stop that. It's X amount of power going into the same relative same size system. Right. So if we could say, I mean, for Subarus in general, there's no reason not to look at a set of STI Brembo's for a vast majority of yeah. the users. Yeah. Between the price and the availability of spares and the cost of spares, you know, the bang for the buck there is unrivaled. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing, I mean, and that'll get most of the people pretty far along. And worst case scenario is yeah. if you start to overwhelm that stuff, you take it off and resell it. I mean, right. no set of gold Brembo's has been left to to the ruins until yeah. the threads are so bashed up that you just can't helicoil it anymore. Right. Right, or or you, you you turn them brown, and then uh, Dussex uh, here would because he was using Brembo's when he was first tracking his car, yeah. he actually turned them darn near black. He had some oh, yeah, gold, yeah. gold Brembo's that nearly got black, and and they they were that was that was the end of them. They they actually were at, when he got hot, they were actually seeping brake fluid from the O rings in between the two halves. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. And so it was like that was okay. You got to go with something. But that's a, that's at a pretty high racing use, correct? Yeah. Yeah. With a lot of yeah. tire, a lot of driver, and yeah. a lot of track time. So, yep. Yep. you know, there, there's a, there's no reason to not look at those Brembo's on the front as a perfect way to get started. Yeah. Like I said, it's easy. It all fits. The parts are relatively cheap, and there's a zillion choices for rotors and pads, and yep. you can get them anywhere. And because that's the other thing people fail to think about, we'll get this sort of oh, when I get you know exotic brake kit from whatever. I was like, yeah, great. What are you going to do when you need rotors? Right. Now, we, this is a good example. Uh, Subaru made a few, this is a probably 06 or 07 spec C car with a Brembo setup on it. Six yeah. piston caliper, two piece rotor. The RAR, I had more yeah. than a few people say, hey, how do I get rotors for this? I'm like, I don't know. Even even better example, do you remember the ProDrive big brake kit? Same thing. They, they, they used an Alcon caliper and it was awesome. Yep. But everything was like unique and proprietary, and it gets, I think you can still get rotors for them, but it's all the way from the UK, and that's the only place yeah. you can get them. Yeah. It's you're you're just you're you're stuck. You're kind of stuck if you if you get something that's too unique. That was a so, good kit. It was funny. I uh, I remember the history of that. That the rights to that were purchased by Cosworth in the United States at one point when okay. they were somewhat active in the Subaru market. Yeah, and then they quickly were like. We don't want none of that. <laughs> right. And they sold right. them all. I bought four or five of the kits, by the way. Okay. And uh, I mean, you can still get pads for it. The rotors were a problem. Even I think Racing Brick made a replacement rotor for that kit. They did. And I'll still get it once every, I don't know, six months. It's like, hey, I got an old Pro Drive kit. I need brake rotors. I'm like, yeah. Call you, have, you got call one or two choices, and that's it. Yeah. 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 So, so we'll go f just put further uh, more into what to do. You know, we looked at maybe STI Brembo's for the front. And if we feel like we want to do another step, which that pretty can happen pretty quickly with tire driver skill and and usage, and there's a number of great kits. AP Racing makes some great kits. Mm -hmm. Brembo does as well. Stop Tech, who is struggling a little bit lately, but there's some good larger caliper, two two piece rotor. So then you you basically enhance that STI Brembo, which is maybe a six piston caliper, um, larger caliper, and now you have a two piece rotor. That's even further, uh, uh, better veining and uh, designed to reject heat. Yeah. And so that's just increasing your front heat mass. In the rear, you know, the rear of the car doesn't have the quite the requirement for the heat load. And that really helps. The two systems that are the easiest, these are the FHI two pots or the uh, Brembo STI Brembo. two yeah. pots. Those will take you pretty far. I would say yeah. that that gets, you know, a further you know, a further group of people forward before you really feel the need to replace that. I, I would say that you don't need to change that until you're into some very yeah. higher horsepower, significant tire and driver uh, situations. On our on our Pikes Peak car, we're running a 365 millimeter Alcon kit up front and we still have the Brembo's in the rear and it, mm -hmm. and it works pretty well. Yeah. But, but that does bring up, I think a point, if we're gonna have this conversation about brake bias, but actually, it, I don't want to go there quite yet because I want to say that, like, if you're if you if you've got an STI, you've got a pretty good brake set to begin with, and and with pads, you should be able to get into the point where you're using our compound tires to to a moderate degree, and and the brakes should be okay with a good pad, good rotor, good brake fluid. The yes. WRX, getting up to the STI Brembos or something equivalent to that with like the AP kit, StopTech kit. That's again is a good point for a lot of 
entry to moderate track use. But then yes. once you once you get to the point where you've gone past where the Brembos are are sufficient, or if you're consuming PAS too quickly, you see you're seeing signs that the PAS that you're using in the Brembos are getting overheated because you've you're, you're using you're on slick tires, you've got high horsepower application, and you're really burning through them. That I think would be the indicator to go up to something even bigger, something in that 355 to 365 millimeter range, which brings me to brake bias. So let me let me tell you what we've noticed and see see if, if you've seen the same thing, which is in both. So Scotty is running a Brembo Club Sport 355 millimeter front caliper. We're running the 365 millimeter Alcon on the Pikes Peak car. And what we've noticed in both cars is these are both GRs. The ABS system basically works something like a proportioning valve so that the rear Brembo is is kind of balanced effectively by the ABS. So like when you're hard on the brakes and the ABS kicks in, it's modulating the front, but it's still applying pressure to the rear. Mm -hmm. And and the problem that we run into is in the Pikes Peak car, then our ABS stopped working. And then all of a sudden you get hard on the brakes and you're locking up the fronts because, because the, the front brake is now way more effective, has, has more capacity, whatever you want to call it, because it's it's much larger and, and, and bigger caliper. Ha, it, would you Have you seen that before? And would you say that it's uh, okay to rely on the ABS to kind of balance out that brake bias if needs be? Or would you say at that point, it might be wise to look at some other way to modulate that? Well, the first thing I would do is we, we just understand the system in general. So it's we basically want to, you know, the car or an ABS. I, I don't know how much it's looking at the yaw sensor and that kind of stuff. But what I what it's probably doing is saying I expect to have X torque in the front and Y torque in the rear, and we could calculate the torque ratio by knowing the size of the parts. I yeah. mean, the torque in the front is simply the piston area times the radius of the rotor, or you know, the, the, and you take the center. Mm -hmm. Same similarly for the rear piston area times radius gives you a torque value. And if you okay. make that dimensionless, then we might expect that that number is just say 70 to 30. So if we take the front kit, if we, if we want to make the front kit bigger, we're not making it bigger to get more torque in the front. We're making it bigger to get more heat mass and improve the feel by having stiffer parts. Mm -hmm. So it's flexing less, it's gripping the same, but it's flexing less and it's changing less as it heats up. So we get the same performance Breaking event, lap after lap after lap. Okay. If your if your kit has increased the torque in the front, then I would certainly consider that that is now confusing the ABS a little bit because based on a the car the computer is not seeing what it expects and it's probably trying to compensate. But then you get it outside of its expected range or these maps that it probably has, and and then it just sort of says I don't know what to do. There's also usually sort of a fail mode. I know on uh, GM cars, we get, right. we talk about ice like mode. Ice, right mode. ice yeah. mode, right. Mm -hmm. The car thinks you're on an extremely loose surface. And that what it does now is it's trying to basically cycle your ABS around a very low friction level. Right. And the result is lock up. Right. And I've, I've experienced that. It is, um, you know, I was in a hot, I was driving in a, in a it was in a Corvette and I go on the brakes and there's nothing, the car is locked up. And I mean, I just went right off. I mean, it happened right. very quickly. And I was at a high speed, tire locked up, and, and you could see the skid mark. I looked back mm. at the skid mark from the ambulance, by the way. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I wasn't injured, but they checked me out because I okay. wrecked. So I saw it. The, the skid mark was clear, clear as day. Dash, 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 skid. Mm. So the ABS tried, locked up three times and released. And then finally it was like, no bueno. And it just said, fine, we're locking up. And I mean, just, you know, four wheel right off, four wheels right wow. off to turn one at VIR. Yeah. And uh, that was, yeah, it took me a long time to get over that, by the way. That was, oh, for sure. I was like, oh, snap, the computer didn't bail me out. What do I do now? <laughs> right. Right. Man. And, and I mean, we, we've actually, we've been going for a little over an hour. So I don't know. We might have to bring it back and talk about more stuff. But yeah. So, and, and, in our car, it was actually an issue with the tone rings. So, so when the ABS was working, the brakes brakes behave normally. We right. modulate them, and everything was fine. When the the tone rings had a fault, then all of a sudden there's no ABS, and that's where you get on the brakes aggressively, and you're just locking the fronts up. 
Yeah. I would so, certainly, I would certainly recommend students basic uh, calculations for brake torque yeah. and at least seeing what change, if any. Ideally, I would have a kit that mimics what Subaru designed so that then the computers are sort of mostly seeing what they expect. And at least because ideally you want to keep within that range. I'm yeah. sure engine tuning has some parallel to that thought. Sure. Uh, overall. When you're, when you're making a step up to that, to, to, to doing a big brake hit like that, I think that the, the tendency is to think that, okay, well, now the car is going to stop way faster. But like, I think we've, we've laid enough groundwork here in the conversation and talked about heat load so much that I think that the concept will be, will make sense that really it's like, you're not going to increase the stopping of the car and maybe you'll, maybe you'll shorten the stopping distance a little bit. Uh, if you've got good, good bias, you're, you're applying front and rear, rear pressure correctly, but it's really the fact that you're going to now be able to hammer on the brakes, use the brakes to their, to their capacity, to their limit over and over and over again, more consistently. It's not that the car is going to stop so much shorter and that's going to make your lap times go faster. It's the fact that the brakes are going to be now be way more consistent because that system can now operate with the heat load that you're putting into it reliably. So now you can get back to just knowing that the brakes are just automatic and focus on, on the driving, not have to worry about it as much. That's exactly right. If, if there, there may be the case where if your system is so underpowered that you cannot get the tires on the limit of traction at all or, or without, you know, full pedal pressure, you know, full weight. So yeah, of course, but we would hope you're not going to the track quite that unprepared. That's right. more like a panic stop. But, right. but again, assuming that you have some friction, brake pad friction on the car, yes, the, the brake kit will allow you to brake very accurately and allow you to do it at the same time the next day around because, you know, we got the brake markers. It's like, well, I went to yep. the five last time. Now I want to try to go to 4.9, yeah. 4.8. If it's not doing the same thing again or if I can't do it over and over right. again, it's pretty hard to, you know, to decrease your lap times if you can't trust the brakes to do what you did the last time around. Yeah. So, so when you're making this step up to a big, a big brake kit, I want to talk about just some of the criteria. So, and we've, we've alluded to it, like pad costs, pad availability. Those are two really big ones. Mm -hmm. um, I would throw in pad thickness because a lot of times a more of a street kit is going to have a much thinner pad because the expectation is that it, the car is not being driven aggressively, not getting as hot as much. Right. And that means that the life of the pads are going to be less potentially, and the heat capacity of the pads could be less. Um, rotor cost, rotor availability, like you, you, you have to kind of think of, of your braking system like you would think of an oil change or, or, or tires to an extent. It's a consumable. Th this is not something you buy the big brake kit, you put it on. Well, that's the, that's the end of the brakes. So it's totally solved. I'll just be able to drive this forever. And now I'm not going to have any problems. It's like, if you're, if you're putting this brake kit on, you're going to be using it. You're going to be cycling through the pads and to a lesser extent, cycling through the rotors too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, if you switch to a kit, you know, it doesn't, you know, let's say you go a few times with your stock set up, you're only getting a couple of days out of the brake pads, the rotors are cracking and it's not working that well. Well, you put the brake kit on there. It's not like you're magically go from two or three weekends to now I can drive all year. Right. You're going to add a weekend or two. You're just going to be able to break a lot better the whole time. You're still going to change the pads at yeah. that point. Yeah. Having the ability to get them relatively easily to know your options or choices in terms of pad compound. And then, uh, you know, with brakes, if you're going to go, I mean, in general, it's just have spares because yeah. they're, they're just by the nature of what they do, the performance under hard track use, you know, pads can come apart and delaminate. Uh, rotors can crack. That's just what happens. So yeah. being prepared and having spares, you go to any race, they all have spares. You yeah. know, with driving event, yeah, people don't really think too much about spares. You're like, oh, I just bought new pads and rotors. What do I need two sets for? Because, I mean, that's oh, just man. because that's yeah. what you do. Yeah, you, know. you, you always bring extra oil, extra brake fluid, like probably yeah. enough to like flush your brakes twice. A, a yeah. spare set of pads for sure, if you can. A spare set of rotors or rings, yeah. because you just you never know what's going to happen. Weird, weird stuff can happen. Like one year, yeah. it's it's a rally car, so it's easier for this to happen. But a rock popped up and got got oh, lodged yeah. between the pad or like right in, in front of the pad, the rotor, and stuck there and just like gouged the rotor, and that was yeah, yeah. pretty much game over. And like 
the system was still okay, but now that, that corner's compromised, and so we had to put in a new rotor and a new pad to get to get back to functional again. Like you just you never know what's gonna happen. You wanna be you wanna be prepared. Yeah, we 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 see it all the time. I mean, that's that's why we put a little bit of a, a warehouse up at the local track. We have spares yeah. for that reason. A lot of it's for my car, because I if I drive all the way up there and get all my stuff up to the track and sign up for the event and get a hotel or all those things that happen that go along with it. Yep. The last thing I want to do is, you know, put the car back on the trailer and go right. home because I didn't bring a set of brake pads. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and, and so, so you mentioned the track and you're going to the track a lot. What are you looking for in your own car at the track? And if there's like another guy or like, let's say a big race team, what are you, what are you looking for? What are you paying attention to with, with their, with their braking systems? Well, the first thing is, you know, can, can the driver, if, you know, like in my case, I'm pretty used to VIR. So I, and I know I have, I have a couple different cars I'll drive and I know kind of what the car feels like. I know the track I've been around it enough times. And so I'm pretty quickly going to figure out if I can drive the car kind of like I normally do. That does it feel right. Does it feel right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing. And then I'm, you know, I, it's just natural or my, my, my habit to, when I get out of the car, I look at the rotors and I look to see mm -hmm. what I see. And based on that, it's, you know, what is the road? It's because it's telling you the story there pretty much. And you like to see, you know, that nice gray sheen of a well bedded brake pad, no crazy smears of pad material or chunks or, you know, whatever. Looking at the pad, looks like it's got plenty of thickness and it's still flat. You know, a lot of that stuff is pretty obvious. And that, that's really about it. After that, it's, it's the driver. You know, when you get to a race team, you know, there's a lot going on. Mm. Oftentimes, they, they have a system, a setup, a supply chain, whatever. So, you know, you got to kind of inch in there a little cautiously. But mostly, it's just a, it's a question. And you know, what do you feel? Does it feel right? Can you, you know, are you worried? If you're worried about the brakes, there's probably some likelihood that you can improve them. Right. That's kind some, of the thing. Some kind like, of issue or inconsistency. Yeah. Is it is yeah. it working? Are you are you for this way? Are you worried about the brakes trying to go faster or are you worried about you mm. or some other, you know, does the car not turn or does the car not stop? I mean, generally there's something preventing you from trying to get faster and we don't want that to be the brakes because they're just, that's, that's all their goal is just to, is to, you know, they have a specific thing to do. And if you can't do that, it's, it's going to be hard to creep up on limits. Right. If your brakes aren't allowing you to do so. Yeah. When, when you're driving at the track and you get out of the car, I mean, it, it's kind of normal to, I would say to like, you get into the pits, you park your car, don't put the parking brake on because your brakes are hot. You don't want those pads just sitting on your rotors. You get it to, to a nice spot, spot, put wheel trucks on it or something like that. Do you, do you find yourself just doing a quick walk around and looking at the car and like looking at the tires, looking at the brakes is, would you say yeah, that, that would normal, be a good, yeah. that's a good habit to get into? Yeah. So, you know, I have a Specky 30. That's a little BMW. One of the things about these cars, it's almost amazing how good they, how fast they are for the low horsepower, but they're very reliable. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, same thing. Uh, you drive the car hard on the limit and you, th th there's a little, it's a funny little front brake pad and it tends mm -hmm. to taper. And so I, I see I have a little mirror and I can stick it in there and look at the inside pad mm -hmm. without taking the wheel off. I look at the rotor surface and I mean, of course, obviously you're looking at it, at least, you know, taking a, the tires are brand new. You pretty much assume that they're not wearing out that quickly, right. but you're looking for any obvious signs of something coming apart or going wrong. I mean, that's, yeah. just, that's just good business, yeah. being, you know, breaks or otherwise. It's good just, habits to get into for it's sure. It's a habit of yeah, going to the track. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, and Ken, it's, we're, we're coming up on an hour and a half, so I got to let you go because I've yeah. taken up too much of your time. <laughs> but I, I do want to ask just one other question because you mentioned driving instruction and, and you said that you, you do instruction. Right. And one of the things that... But we, we've kind of talked through a progression here, but we haven't really talked about driver ability, driver level. And I would say that because people kind of just assume the brakes are always going to work, it's natural for in, inter, uh, novice and intermediate drivers to overuse the brakes. And a lot of times, if you, I would say that if you think you really need to do like a really big upgrade, like if you're seeing all of the signs that we talked about for an indicator that you need to go from your, your brake system into something bigger and, and you, but you've only done a few handfuls of track days or something like that. Well, sometimes it's because you are overusing the brakes. It's not necessarily that the brakes are not capable in it. Oftentimes it can be that 
they are just being overused or improperly used. So I know I just wanted to, I guess, first off, would you agree with that? Would you say that that's somewhat common? Well, there's a lot of things to think about on that. I would say that I'm generally right seating with a green group student. Okay. So their most typical problem is not braking hard at all. Okay. So okay. they're not using the brakes anywhere near their capacity, at least in terms of the amount of braking force that you can get out of the tire. Yeah. You know? Okay. So it's always the goal is like, let's pick a speed going into a, and into a turn where there's a heavy braking zone and let's do that speed. Even if we, even if we get there the next time around, we get there quicker, but let's stop it. Let's just say 120. Yeah. Let's go 120 every time and move the braking zone up. And I want you to show me that you can quickly get the car stopping as almost as hard as it will stop or close to it. And then if we stop short, so be it. Then the next time we know we've got another 20 feet can move and we're it up. creep up on that limit. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can drag in the brakes or getting on the brakes early. You're just kind of needlessly building heat and you're not really slowing down. So, well, and, and I guess kind of where I was going with it is you don't have a sense of what corner speed you can actually take. And yes. so you're shedding way more speed to go into the corner than you actually need to, yes. which is putting more heat into the system than you actually need to, yeah. because that, that feel, that feel for what, how fast the car can go around a corner. That's one of the more, more, if not most difficult things to figure out or find. Yeah, yeah. It's as hard. It's as hard as figuring out how, how much it'll break. Yeah. Is yeah. how fast it'll turn or how, how much, you know, lateral acceleration it will take. So, so where mm -hmm. I what I was wondering is, is, would you say that it would also be worth getting a little bit, at least an instructor opinion maybe, or, or maybe a little bit of driving instruction before you would make that leap to a big brake kit, depending on the application. I'd say this would maybe fit better with an STI versus a WRX. The WRX, the, the brakes are a more of a known deficient quantity oh, yeah. versus an STI, but like, especially if an STI, if you feel like the brakes are really deficient right out of the gate, I kind of feel like getting a little bit of a, an instructor perspective or some instruction to see how you're using the brakes and, and taking the car through the corners might, might be really helpful at that point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so th th that's simple. If, you know, if we get a customer and he says, Hey, I have a WRX and I'm going to do a whole bunch of track days. I'm like, take the brakes off the car now. Yeah. Save yourself the headache. Right. They're not going to work. Right. They might work for a weekend or two, but, Unless you just simply are not developing as a driver, you're just going to buy up. Well, well, your other option is order four, four, four or five sets of pads and a right. stack of rotors and a, take it with you. Right. Because they'll, they'll work for a couple sessions to a day or something like that, but right. not well and not for long. Right. You come out with an STI, it's like there's a lot of brake pad and rotor out there that you can go through before you could sort of, I mean, you know, we, we, we can. We can look back. I don't know if there's too many like uh, stock class, really STIs or even EVOs anymore, but you know, we're, at, at relatively stock power, those brake systems were doing pretty well. Now there was a replacement regime. A caliper was only good for a season. Mm -hmm. uh, you pretty much are going through a set of pads in a, a race weekend or two, yeah. but they will stop the car. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's on a racing yeah. tire at in racing conditions. Right. So, and yeah, of course, instruction, there's always no reason because, you know, have someone else see and it way to arrive with someone, one or the other or both, because, yeah. you know, the braking problems, the one thing about them is they surface rapidly and they're very hard to miss. I mean, right. it's, you know, it's easy to know when your car's not stopping right. It just doesn't feel right. And it's, you know, it's, it's essentially frightening. I mean, right, right. Stuff's coming at you in your car, you can't, it's not going to happen, you know. Yeah. And I guess my, my, my main reason for bringing it up and at the end, this is, this is the, this is the tip, the top tip for the people that listen to the end of the podcast is that can be a real, uh, it can be a breakthrough point for, for development as a driver. You know, if, if you never realize that the car can carry through more speed, what that feels like, how to find that, mm -hmm. that your, your lap times, your overall speed is always going to be lower. Once you oh, yeah. find, once you find that, once you realize that that's out there, um, all of a sudden like that can, you, it, it's like, it's kind of like another, another door opens and you realize, okay, this is actually what it can do. It, it could even honestly be as something as simple as having like everything cool and everything ready, having an instructor drive your car with you in the passenger seat 
that like a more experienced driver so that you can actually now feel what they do with the car compared to what you do with the car yeah and how yeah. they're how they're stopping how much speed they're carrying through it because if you're if you're shedding way too much speed you're you're going to be putting a ton of heat into your brakes and Correct. the sooner as, as you're as you're trying to progress with the driver the sooner you can kind of have that realization get that information and in, in, realize that you as the driver and with your input have a big impact on what the capacity of the brakes is that can be a good quicker path to going faster than, than yeah. just throwing a big brake hit on it and just just continue to go to the track and not getting that outside information not a, not getting that extra perspective and you can do and you can do that with data too again it's just yeah. getting you know turn the lap in the car and, and and see what it shows and then have someone else do the same faster lap time and you can compare this stuff and see right away because it's it's all fairly basic i mean it's physics it's you know v start yeah. minus v initial uh yep. the end there's a there's a power and momentum that's being absorbed and yeah you know and, it, and at this point there's so many good apps for like your phone like track attic and stuff like that yeah. where you can get you can see what what your straight line speed is what your cornering speed is like yeah. where your breaking points are it's it's actually really easy now for for any of us to actually start to get into some of that data to actually look at what you're doing with the car and figure out like, am I, am I really utilizing the car to the best of its abilities or, or how, how your, your car stacks up to somebody else that's going faster by looking at, well, where are they getting on the brakes? How hard are they right. getting on the brakes versus where am I getting on the brakes and how hard all that? It's a good point. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, well, Ken, I have taken up a lot of your evening and I, and I thank you very much for, for setting out the time and coming down and chat with us. This has been a great conversation and We'll see what kind of questions pop up. I might have to bring you back on and, and pick your brain about maybe some more details about these big brake hits or pads or something, but we'll just have to see. We're certainly happy to do so. I hope it's interesting to the to the crowd out there and uh, hopefully there's something beneficial without, yes. uh, like I said, it was a long time. So uh, yes, hopefully absolutely. we got some points that make sense for the-, for the I team. think so. I think we did. Well, All well, right. thank you very much, Ken. Appreciate it. And as always, uh, you know, thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. And until next time, stay tuned with Flat Irons Tuning. All right, very good. Thanks again, John. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. Once again, we'd like to let you know that your support is what makes this show possible. Be sure to check out our online store at flatironstuning.com for any of your aftermarket or OEM super parts needs. And as always, stay tuned with Flatiron's Tuning.